and we'll go ahead and get things started here. So once again, welcome to this special presentation and overview of organ donation during National Donate Life Month. And we're going to have this educational webinar intended to bring attention to organ donation in our communities. And we're also going to share how the gift of life has certainly made a big impact on our community. And I would like to introduce myself. I am Amanda Garcia, the communications coordinator for the Northern Region of Texas Organ Sharing Alliance. I'll be your host for today. And you've also heard from Clarissa Thompson. She is a senior communications coordinator from the Central Region of TOSA. She's going to be taking your questions at the end of this webinar. And Edwina Garza, if you want to give a big hello to everyone here, she is a senior communications coordinator from TOSA covering the Southern Region. And she'll be also taking your questions questions, monitoring social media and your comments, and she has a very special announcement of a prize, so stay tuned for that. And in this webinar, we're going to be covering a variety of different things surrounding organ donation and National Donate Life Month, talking about the significance of what April is and why we celebrate National Donate Life Month, and we're going to go into the donation process, how it works for organ, eye, and tissue donation. And we're going to also talk about the need for organ donation, such a big need out there, not just nationally, but here in Texas as well. And you're going to hear stories of hope from our volunteers of Texas Organ Sharing Alliance. And then we'll take your questions and answers and also help you learn how you can sign up to save lives. And remember, you can ask questions and chat with us throughout this webinar. Please enter your questions at the bottom of your screen in the Q&A box, and we'll get to those questions at the end of this presentation. Wonderful. And as you can see with all the fun garden theme we have going on today, we are in a garden, and that is for a reason. The National Donate Life Month is celebrating the theme of Garden of Life that is observed in April of each year, and National Donate Life Month helps to encourage Americans to register as organ, eye, and tissue donors, and to also honor those who have saved lives through the gift of donation. And I would like to welcome our experts on the field of donation. We have Ismail Shamas from Texas Organ Sharing Alliance. He is the external operations liaison from TOSA. Lemuel Bradshaw is the public relations manager of United Tissue Resources. And we have Daniel Mercado, division director of Miracles in Sight. And so you're going to be hearing from this panel of experts who are going to go into detail of organ eye tissue donation. But I would also like to mention that we have wonderful volunteers joining us today. Jordan Lopez is a donor family and AJ Gonzalez is a kidney recipient and you'll be hearing their stories of hope. And so today we talked about going into the donation process and how it works. Organ eye and tissue donation really involves a complex series of events requiring teamwork among hospital staff, procurement teams, and the transplant teams. And even though cases do vary, the following describes the basic steps in donation. So let's bring in Ismil from Texas Organ Sharing Alliance to give us an overview of the donation process. Thank you, Amanda. I'd like to point out too in this picture, that's actually me with the blue clipboard in the background uh, <laughs> working a donor case. Uh, really when we look at uh, organ donation and how everything starts, everything really starts with the diagnosis. So at first a person who sustained a, a severe brain injury is put on artificial life support. Um, doctors and hospital staff work extremely hard to save the patient's life, but in some cases, uh, this is not possible. And you can kind of go into two different methods of this scenario where there's a complete brain death or an irre irreversible loss of brain function or the brain injury or severe brain injury. Uh, it leads to an extremely poor prognosis and the family decides on withdrawal of this life support. And in these cases, that is when we can move forward and evaluate for the potential of donation. Uh, this will then start with the referral from the hospital. The hospital will call in to us, TOSA, the procurement organization, for an initial evaluation. Uh, us as the OPO uh, would work closely with the hospital and evaluate the potential of donation uh, in different scenarios. When we evaluate the patient to see if they meet criteria for donation, 
We also at this time will check to see if the patient is a registered donor. If the patient is a candidate for donation uh, and they are not a registered donor, we as the OPO will get consent and speak with the legal next of kin of the patient uh, for consent for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Uh, we talk with the family and do medical evaluations uh, throughout the whole process and create uh, uh, basically a information chart for transplant centers to be able to evaluate in order to create a matching of recipients. Once we are able to find a recipient for these gifts, the teams will work together and coordinate to find a particular time that we can all meet at the recovering hospital uh, to uh, recover the gifts that will be going to the recipients in a surgical recovery. And once we've completed, uh, POSA is also involved with the packings and preservation of these gifts. And then we go into the transplant centers accepting these gifts for transplantation. Amanda, the next slide. Wonderful. And I'll also toss that over to Lem and Daniel. Could you expand a little bit more on tissue and cornea donation and how that process works? A little different than organ donation. So it's different, but it's a partnership because in many cases we can recover, surgically recover for tissue right after the surgical recovery of organs in an operating suite. But that is not often or always the case. I say often because tissue recovery, tissue donation can occur in any unit of the hospital. So even outside of a critical care unit where there is the potential for organ recovery, there may be the potential for allograft tissue recovery. We move to make that surgical recovery after the heart stops beating or after cardiac time of death occurs or how sometimes it's referred to as a systole. And at that time, our coordinators do the same type of matching and information gathering and sharing that coordinators from our partners in organ procurement do. We meet with the family by phone in our case, so that's another very uh, unique uh, characteristic of tissue donation. We would be making contact with families and also contact with medical professionals who help us determine whether there is true eligibility for recovery over the phone. So once that is done, we can then begin the process of establishing a timeline for potential surgical recovery, uh, also, one thing to consider is that we don't have to match uh, tissues from donors to recipients before the surgical recovery can occur because of the unique way that tissue is prepared for transplant and then stored, we can make those surgical recoveries and have that tissue then available for, in some cases, up to five years, depending on the type of graft, bone and skin and so forth. And lastly, that is also the time that we would begin to establish the relationships with the donor families. Uh, from the time we make initial contact, sometimes these continue for decades or more. We have donor family events that bring them together for years and years after the day or night that they lost their loved one and decided to donate life. Absolutely. And so for the eye bank, uh, there are many similarities as well. And just like the tissue bank, our tissue does not need to be matched to the recipient. Um, another key difference is our, our tissue uh, is not able to be preserved for five years, but it can be for up to 14 days. So the, the eye tissue is a living tissue, and we also have the privilege of looking very closely uh, under various microscopes to verify that uh, the quality of the tissue is good and to ensure a good outcome for the recipients. We have a little bit more time. However, all the rest of the process is very much the same um, for the iBank. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for going into the process and how that all works. And we want to go into the question and answer portion of this webinar to kind of answer some of those common questions that we get out there in the community. So thank you for walking us through that process. And for Ismo and Lem and Daniel from all our donation partners, can you answer how does organ eye tissue donation heal and save lives? I'll let Lem take it away first. So allograft tissue, which is actually Things such as bone, skin, veins, ligaments and tendons, nerves and heart valves, all of that can be surgically recovered 
and stored or banked. So you hear the term tissue bank. If I may, you may even hear the term I bank. Uh, the immediacy of the need of organs, you'll never hear bank because those organs have to go directly from donor to recipient. But with us, uh, tissue, it can be stored so more people at a longer period after the initial surgical recovery might be able to benefit from uh, the gifts of tissue donation. In fact, one tissue donor might be able to impact the lives of 75 to 100 or more people when all told, all the graphs are total uh, that are gifted by just one donor. Wonderful, Daniel? Yeah, and uh, for the iBank, um, lives are saved um, in a sense because you're restoring vision in someone who is blind. So if you can imagine uh, not being able to see your loved ones or to see the meaningful things in your life or to do the things, or it may be more difficult to do the things that you love to do, um, in a sense, um, it is a lifesaver. Um, approximately 12.7 million people are waiting for a corneal transplant worldwide. And our little eye bank here just outside of Austin has been functioning since the 1970s. And over that time, tens of thousands of recipients have received tissue through our eye bank. And so I'm uh, very grateful to be a part of that. <clears throat> and thankful to all of you folks who are considering being a donor or have already made that decision. Um, again, it's a huge impact and a beautiful gift to be able to store uh, vision in those that are blind from uh, corneal disease, traumatic injury, or, or other diseases of the eye. And Ismail from Texas Organ Share Alliance. When we evaluate for a full organ transplantation, we can evaluate for all life-saving gifts of the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, and intestines. And these, as Lem kind of mentioned too, we don't do any organ banking. These are direct transplants from recovery and normally from recovery into transplantation would be happening within less than 24 hours. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Yes. And one person can save eight lives through organ donation and certainly 75 lives or more through tissue and cornea donation. So quite a big impact in how organized and tissue donation really, truly does save lives. And so the next question we want to go into is, why is there such a need for organ eye and tissue donation? I'll pass that off to Ismail. Currently, uh, for organ uh, tissue and eye donation, there's a great need, especially for organ when you talk about the waiting list that currently there's over 110,000 people in the United States waiting for an organ for transplant. And even here in Texas, there's approximately a little bit over 10,000 people waiting within the Texas state for a gift of an organ. And Daniel, would you mind expanding on cornea donation and how there's quite a big need out there as well? Sure, absolutely. Um, so in terms of um, being able to function or do what you do, um, vision is important uh, also for work. So if you translate uh, those that are receiving these transplants and the amount of work that they can do to be productive, um, the lifetime value of a corneal transplant is estimated to be something like $6 billion. So not only are we able to uh, provide folks with the opportunity to be with the, to see the people they love and to uh, see meaningful things in their life. Uh, they can also continue with whatever work and service they have um, for the world. And working out there in the community, Daniel, can you talk about how you've seen the impact of how there is a need out there for these donors and how the recipients are so grateful? Absolutely. Um, I've, been, I've been privileged to, to see some events that uh, TELSA has put together um, and some in the past here for the iBank. Um, and every single recipient is eternally grateful, uh, thankful. Uh, you know, they're folks just like you and me. They, they want to just be able to enjoy their life and uh, be a part and see their family and, and all the things that uh, that, that provides that, that vision can give to us. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've had young children that have had, um, you know, various diseases of the eye that have, you know, just starting on in life. Um, they're given kind of a second chance to really expand their horizons. Um, 
with uh, the uh, receiving the gift and being able to see again. So it's mainly for me, it's, it's the children uh, or those that have children. Uh, being able to see family is, is something that's really impacted me and um, makes me get up every morning and come to work. So. <laughs> so great. And Lemuel, would you mind also touching on why there's such a need for organized tissue donation? So um, according to figures from last year from the American Association of Tissue Banks, they are the national organization that maintains the standards for tissue banking in the United States. According to their figures from just last year alone, 2.5 million tissue transplants were performed. And in our service area, that is the service area of United Tissue Resources, we distributed just under 11,000 tissue grafts in a pandemic year, which was just slightly under our pre-pandemic levels, and they are increasing every single year. These procedures for which we supply tissue can include everything from um, dental procedures where bone is used to repair damage or disease to the jawline, up to and including skin grafts for wounded warriors, burn victims, trauma victims, up to and including life-saving heart valve transplants for infants born with that particular deformity. It may not be as well known what allograft tissue can provide for people in the way of saving and enhancing lives, but in terms of raw numbers, certainly not in terms of the impact or importance, but in terms of raw numbers, more allograft tissue transplants are performed than any other form of transplantation every single year. And it has been that way every year for a decade or more, if not more than that. There is a need, a profound need for more people to consider right alongside the life-saving gifts of, of uh, organ donation and the life-changing gifts, as Daniel described, of corneal donation to consider becoming tissue donors. The need is great and growing every single year. Great. And can someone on the panel please address how anyone and everyone can really sign up to be an organ donor? Sure. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Daniel, I'll let you go. <laughs> well, um, I'm no expert on signing up for the registry. I think that's more of a, a Tosa is really spearheading that. But I do know myself as a registered donor, when I went to renew my license, I was able to choose to be a donor. And um, that was a really easy way. However, I know that you can go on to the Donate Life registry online. Um, that is another way to sign up. But I think, uh, uh, um, and, and if you have more details on that, that'd be great. But I think more importantly, too, is if, um, if you are choosing to be a donor, letting your family know is, is incredibly important because uh, your family, uh, in the event of your passing, um, you know, they're critical to the work that we do in terms of uh, uh, providing us with information uh, that we'll need in order to perform the recoveries. Um, and just discussing that, if, if you're able to speak with your family, let them know ahead of time, it's important. I know a lot of folks don't like to speak on that, but it, it, it's a very important thing and a beautiful, beautiful gift if you can do it, if you choose to do so. Uh, but yeah, whenever you re, um, get your license or you can go on to the Donate Life website. Is that correct? Yes, that cover certainly <laughs> correct. And you know, if you want to touch on that as well. Definitely, I 100% agree with Daniel on that. And the biggest thing that he was backing and it's 100% true is letting your family know your wishes, uh, even if you are a registered donor or don't even, if you don't sign up, letting your family know is always the best option as they are the people we end up talking to at the event if someone is to pass. But you can always do donatelifetexas.org. You can do the the DMV registry with the sign up on the box. And there's even more options. I know on an iPhone, you can even go into your settings and sign up. Uh, you can go to a Donate Life drive event where we do signups with UTR um, and uh, Miracles in Sight, just multiple, multiple options. But talking to your family is always the best option. Certainly true. And Lemuel, can you touch on how also just anyone and everyone should really consider becoming an organ donor? Well, I first I want to say ditto to everything that those guys just said. Uh, they they filled in for each other the, any gaps or holes so brilliantly. I have to say that when I always I've been an advocate for signing up on the registry for about two decades now, and I always say in, in those twenty years 
technology has advanced so much that I started long ago and now I even, I say it even more, just Google it. If you wonder, if you get nothing else out of this wonderful uh, opportunity we've been given to talk about organ, eye and tissue donation, if you get nothing else, remember you can Google Donate Life Texas. Google Donate Life Texas, three words, I say it again. Donate Life Texas, and it will pull up both the registry and a database. So if you have questions uh, that, are, that keep you on the fence as far as determining whether this is right for you to register, your questions, your issues, your concerns, it's not the first time that those have been asked or that they've been addressed. There, are, uh, there is a Q&A section right there on the Donate Life Texas website as there is on the Texas Organ Sharing Alliance website that lets you get some of those answers. And it's 2021, there's an app for everything. So if you happen to run into one of us at one of those events, many of us have an app right on our phone that we can scan the back of your driver's license, the barcode there and add you to the registry. There is really no way that you could miss an opportunity to get information and to make your wishes known. And as my colleagues have said, you have to, it is very important to have that conversation with your family that this is what you wanna do. We don't want the first time that they hear about your decision to become an organ eye and tissue donor to be on what is the worst day of their lives when they're mourning your loss. We want you to have already had those conversations and worked out the details of you becoming an organ eye and tissue donor. Yes, so true. It certainly does lift the burden off the family and really does provide insight in how it can save lives. Thank you. And so the next question we want to address is how organ donation really can vary with what is able to be donated. And so we will address the panel, Ismail, Lem, and Daniel. If you can answer the question, what can be donated? I'll pass it off to Ismail from Texas Organ Sharing Alliance first. When we're looking at organ donation, we can see here on the left-hand side of the screen, you can donate the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, intestines, and pancreas. Uh, and when we even look at that too, you can go a little bit further and the lungs can uh, be split and be shared with two different donors, as well as the liver being split uh, into two different segments and shared with two different donors. And the kidneys are quite oftenly split and shared with two different donors. Being able to maximize these gifts and how many people they are able to help. Great. And Lem, if you can address tissue donation. So on the right-hand side in green, Apart from what you see at the very top cornea, and I'll let my colleague from Miracles Insight speak about that, everything from tendons down, really bone, skin, veins, ligaments and tendons, nerves and heart valves can all be recovered, surgically recovered, and used to affect the life of a recipient in need. And with all of that told, in many cases, several of the same type of grafts can be surgically recovered. That's what increases so much, almost exponentially, depending on this, the, the health of the donor, the ability of tissue to save and heal. Great, and Daniel. Absolutely. Well, um, obviously you can donate your eyes. Um, and what you need to know is that when you do register, if you don't feel comfortable with donating a, a certain tissue, you can make a choice on that. Of course, you know, um, everything is needed and what you, what you can do is, is, is incredibly, you know, important, uh, but that is a choice you, you can make uh, when you go, go to register. Um, and so uh, for eyes, um, you might not know that you can actually potentially help up to 10 people by donating your eyes. Uh, and this is why. The cornea, the cornea is the most common transplant and that is the clear outer portion of the eye it's about the size and shape of a contact lens. Um, and again, you can, you can choose to only donate your corneas if you wish. However, it is possible to donate the white part of the eye, the sclera, and that part is important uh, for traumatic injury. It's often used in, in uh, glau glaucoma treatments um, for uh, prosthetic uh, implants. So um, the white part of the eye, the sclera, is incredibly important uh, as well. Um, and of course, uh, there's always the potential for research as well. If you want to uh, donate your eyes for research, those eyes can be used to try different techniques for surgical procedures. Uh, right now, we're, we're working with uh, researchers that are uh, working on medications for different treatments of different eye diseases. So uh, the, the eyes be small 
be, be them, you know, so small, but they are a huge impact uh, in the world for many people. So that's all. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah. And it really leads me to the next question that we get asked often out in the community is, does organ eye and tissue donation affect funeral arrangements? And I'll pass it off to Ismail from Texas Organ Sharing Alliance. Sure, when looking at recovery of any donation scenario, the recoveries are specifically set up to not affect funeral arrangements. Uh, you can still have an open or closed casket service based on family wishes, um, and you can still allow for um, uh, everybody to come view. The real uh, way that it may affect in some small ways is just timing. Uh, but in most cases, the timing of these is fairly quickly for the recovery and then can lead to the funeral arrangements right afterwards. Yes, and Lemuel from United Tissue Resources. So to piggyback on what Ismail said, that it, it's a matter of timing uh, is probably the way that it impacts it the most as far as when the actual the donor's body is turned over to a funeral home. But I wanna to touch on the importance of the communication aspect of what we do uh, at United Tissue Resources. It is. When I mentioned earlier that we established the relationship with our donor family, even from the time of the very first contact we have with them to uh, determine eligibility of the donor and to ask in many cases for their permission in the case of unregistered donors to move forward with surgical recovery. At that time, one of the things that we communicate with that family uh, is to determine how they would want their loved ones to be presented in a funeral. And we work with them and the funeral home to make sure that what we do during the process of surgical recovery for allograft tissue does not in any way interfere with the ability that they have to present their loved one in whatever way they wish uh, as far as their end of life plans are concerned. Whether that be, as Ismael mentioned, an open casket funeral, closed casket or cremation, of course. So it is very important to us that we provide the opportunity for a family to go through with whatever is their tradition as far as the burial ceremony is concerned. Yes, and Daniel from Miracles in Sight. Right, and uh, speaking on communication, we work very closely with uh, folks at TOSA and UTR to ensure that we are completing our work as efficient as possible in the most respectful manner uh, to those, donor and, uh, those donors and donor families. So that's also part of the communication piece. Um, there are times though where we are only uh, going to recover eyes. Um, and it's good to know that um, our highly trained recovery specialists can go to wherever the donor may be. Uh, that can, it usually typically is a hospital. However, if uh, the family wishes to move um, their loved one to a funeral home, we can actually perform the surgical procedure there as well. Um, also, it's good to note that um, the recoveries can be as short as one hour long. So, um, like I said, our, our recovery specialists are, are, are trained, um, very well trained to work efficiently, and we always want to respect the family's wishes. We try our best to communicate with all the stakeholders involved. Um, and so, uh, I would say that uh, there is minimal effect on funeral arrangements uh, when there is an eye recovery of tissue. Great. And that leads into the next question. And we've touched on this a bit. How is tissue donation different from organ donation? I'll pass that off to Lemuel. So first and foremost, uh, I, well, not foremost, but first, of course, we mentioned the immediacy, how quickly organs have to go from donor to recipient. With tissue, we have up to, though it is not always the case, up that it is done in uh, 24 hours, we have up to, in some cases, up to 24 hours as a time limit to make that surgical recovery. And during that period, and that is first of all influenced by a lot of factors. Uh, it's not just a given that it will be 24 hours after. Sometimes we are given less time. So we stay, this is where communication comes into play again. We stay in touch with the hospital, with the donor family, with funeral homes and so forth, so that we can maintain those timelines. Once tissue is surgically recovered, it is prepared for transplantation transplantation that may not be done uh, within a matter of uh, days or hours or even weeks, but in some cases that tissue can be stored and used for up to years later after the initial surgical recovery. So that's another big difference between us 
and organ donation, how long we can wait before, in many cases, that tissue benefits others. One thing, another thing to consider is that when you receive an allograft tissue transplant, unlike, at least in my knowledge, to my knowledge, I don't know of anyone who's received an organ transplant and doesn't have to take immunosuppressant or anti-rejection medication for the rest of their life to keep their life-saving gift from being rejected, allograft tissue is accepted by the body as the body's own tissue is, and it is used as a scaffolding, if you will, so that the body can regenerate on top of that gifted graft, meaning that there is less need if the person has been traumatically injured for repeat surgeries. If you put a pin in, for example, you may have to go in and take that pin out after surgery to allow that person to heal. Allograft tissue is accepted by the body. So there's less repeat surgery and with less surgeries comes less recovery time and less risk of infection. All of those are benefits of allograft tissue transplantation. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for expanding and also answering some of these common questions that we get asked out there in the community. And as you can see on your screen, one organ and tissue donor can save eight lives and restore the health of over 75 lives or more. So really please consider organ donation and how it has the life-saving power. And so now we're going to also hear from our special volunteers of Texas Organ Sharing Alliance and hear their personal stories of hope. Clarissa? Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, panelists, too, for answering those uh, wonderful questions. Uh, it's my pleasure at this moment to introduce our donor family speaker, Jordan Lopez. Lopez. Uh, she is a TOSA volunteer from San Antonio who advocates for organ donation on behalf of her family. Her sister, Samantha, gave the gift of life in 2020 as a successful organ and cornea donor. And as you will see, their bond goes way beyond sisterhood. So, Jordan, if you will please chair. Thank yes, you. good morning, everyone. My name is Jordan Lopez. I am a part of a donor family and a donor recipient. My donor holds a very special place in my heart. My donor happens to be my little sister, Samantha Caballero. My sister was only 12 years old when her life was unexpectedly taken away. Halloween night 2020, my mom and Samantha were hit head on by a drunk driver. Samantha was rushed to the nearest hospital where life-saving efforts were made. Sadly, there was no doctor who could save Samantha. After numerous brain scans and tests done to Samantha, she was showing no brain activity at all. Samantha was then pronounced brain dead. It was all just a huge shock to my family and I. Samantha was talented, smart, beautiful, and so full of life. Samantha had a lot to offer this world. With that being said, my mom and I agreed that Samantha had the opportunity to make a huge impact on others' lives, although she was no longer with us. We agreed to make Samantha a donor not only because of how we felt, but based off her personality. Samantha was selfless and caring person, so we knew that she wouldn't say no to saving others. So Samantha was also a huge daddy's girl. Her dad unfortunately passed away five years prior to her. Our dad was registered as an organ donor as well, and he got the opportunity to have his corneas donated. So knowing her daddy wanted to help save lives, we knew she would want to follow in his footsteps as well. I was so focused on Samantha helping others, my mom made me realize my sister had the opportunity to help me as well. In high school, I was told I had keratoconus in both my eyes. Keratoconus is where the clear tissue on the eye bulges outward like a cone. I was told in the end that I would end up going blind by maybe my 30s. My eye doctor told me there was no cure, but I could have a cornea transplant done to help with my vision loss. To be honest, I was terrified being so young and losing my vision. For years, I kept putting off seeing anyone doing my surgery because I was just too scared. I wanted, I didn't want to go through with it, even though my vision got worse. After the discussion with my mom about my sister possibly being a donor to me, I quickly called my doctor and went to be evaluated the next day. I got the green light to go ahead with the transplant in my left eye only because my right eye wasn't so bad where I needed to have the surgery anytime soon. Prior to this opportunity even being possible, I honestly felt like I wasn't going to be able to go on with life without Samantha. Samantha has and will always mean everything to me. Samantha was my best friend, sister, and basically my child to me being that I helped raise her. 
once I got confirmation I was going forward with the transplant, automatically I felt a huge weight fall off me. Knowing that I will always have a piece of my sister has been life changing. I get the opportunity to now carry her legacy and she gets to continue to see her life through me still. By me now having the blessing of being a recipient, it has made me value life more and has made me want to do more to help our community. I'm not going to lie, when Tosa first approached me, they did it the same day I found out there was nothing more that could be done to save my sister. So I was not in the best of moods. Surprisingly, I could say I enjoyed talking to Tosa more than I did anyone else in the hospital. Everyone I had spoken to Tosa had been so amazing. I'm honestly not just saying that. I will say I didn't have the best experience with the hospital staff. The thing I love the most about Tosa is they were sympathetic, empathetic, and very friendly. They honestly made me feel like they understood what I was going through and that my sister wasn't just a transaction. I ask a lot of questions and I mean a lot of questions to the point where sometimes I feel like people get annoyed. With Tosa, they were so detailed with explaining the process of everything that I didn't even really have to ask questions. When I did ask questions, they definitely did not make me feel like I was a bother. I can't thank everyone enough who I have worked with Tosa for all the help they have done making sure my sister was taken care of and continues to honor her life. Because of Tosa, Samantha was able to save five other lives besides mine. The grieving process is never easy. By being a donor, it does help make a rainbow in someone else's storm. By becoming a registered donor, it also lets your loved ones know you left this earth being a hero. It has been a rough time going through this grieving process, but I try my hardest to always look at the positive in every situation, no matter what the situation is. I would give anything to have my sister back, no question. Although her story is very tragic, I'm trying to bring the most positivity out of her story. My number one thing has been I've been working on from the situation is awareness. It's not every day you get to hear a story like Samantha and mine. I can say I've been able to get a view on life from being a donor family and a recipient. Being on the other side for me has been fulfilling and I don't regret any decision I've made during this process. I've chosen to become a volunteer because of how much I strongly believe in the support of organ donation. This experience overall gets you thinking and becomes a real eye-opener. I myself am registered as an organ donor last year. I strongly encourage those who are not to register as well. Thank you everyone to listening to our story. Thank you so much, Jordan. That was a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing Samantha's legacy. And next, please help us welcome Anjanette Gonzalez. After waiting for nearly nine years uh, of waiting for a kidney, AJ received the call she has been hoping for this past year, a second chance at life. And I believe she's uh, trying to turn on. Uh, AJ, if you wouldn't mind turning on your video and audio. Yeah, I think I got it. Can y'all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sorry, I'm not technically savvy. <laughs> um, again, my name is AJ Gonzalez. And in October of 2011, I was diagnosed um, with kidney failure, totally to my surprise. I actually had gone to my doctor that morning thinking I had walking pneumonia and was told that um, I could not leave her office unless I left in an ambulance to go directly to the hospital because I was already um, having cardiac issues. And I told her, I said, you've gotta be kidding. I'm like, I, I have to go to work. And she's like, no, you're going to the hospital. So I did talk her into letting me drive myself to the hospital um, in which I spent the next 63 days in um, the hospital when I was in Dallas. I had several complications they had to do emergency surgery to put in a, a graph in my arm so they could start immediate dialysis on me. Um, so I went through that um, process. Being told that I was in kidney failure really affected not just my health, but affected my independence, affected my career, affected um, relationships I had with people. So um, in March of 2012, 
things just got too complicated. I was in Dallas by myself, my family, and I decided that it was time for me to come home, try to recoup, repair, and go on. I unrealistically, for some reason, thought, you know, this isn't going to take long. I'm going to get on the donor list. I mean, not donor, excuse me, on the transplant list, and I will be back to my regular life in about a year. Well, silly me didn't realize that the whole process to get on a list even takes about a year. But, and I was also under the misconception that, well, you know, I'll just have like my sister or my cousin get tested and I can get a, do a donation that way. Um, Cause I had heard that that was a little bit easier and wouldn't take as long. Unfortunately, all of my friends, all of my family got tested and for whatever reason, I wasn't a match to any of them either. They had health issues that we discovered. Um, there was, you know, just issues genetically, maybe not the same blood type, whatever. So I kept thinking, well, I'm on the donor list, or excuse me, on the transplant list. It'll take two years. Well, two years came and went. Three years came and went. And it, by this time, I had tried different programs. I had tried in San Antonio, and I had finally ended up in Houston. And I can remember about, I'd say about five years in on the wait, I called my, my coordinator, who's the person who works with you and lets you know your status and lets you know if there's any offers that are coming your way. I called her and I told her, I said, I'm done. I, I, I don't wanna do dialysis. I mean, I, I don't wanna have to wait anymore. And whatever happens on dialysis happens because dialysis takes up a lot of your time. You have to go three times a week up to four and a half hours, maybe five, depending if there's, you know, complications during your treatment. And so it just really takes up a lot of your time. It takes up um, your ability to travel just to get up and go, which was one of my favorite things to do. Now, as a dialysis patient, I had to coordinate and I had to account for treatment time anywhere I went. So I had called my coordinator and I said, I'm done. I'm just done. Whatever happens, happens at this point. Because also I had found out that approximately 22 to 20 transplant patients who are waiting die a day. And so every day I woke up thinking, please, Lord, let today not be the day that I'm one of the 22. So my coordinator was like, no, 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 you can't give up. We've come this far. Um, you've you know, done everything you need to. Your time is coming. Your time is coming. And I just kept thinking, she's crazy. But I stuck with it. I found something else to occupy my time. I went back to school because during this whole process, I also figured out, you know, who better to help other transplant patients than a transplant person? So I've gone back to school and I've gotten my master's degree in social work with the idea and the intention to hopefully join a transplant team, become a social worker or to become um, somebody who works with uh, transplant evaluation processes um, something along the line of ptosis and organ procurement. And so we went along, trudging along. Along the way, I got a couple of offers, um, either for whatever reason, I was either second in line. They always have a backup to the primary. Um, sometimes I was a match, but if there's a pediatric patient before me, they get it before I would, which is fine and totally understandable. Well, then finally, um, uh, February the 7th, Super Bowl Sunday of this year, I got the phone call. My coordinator called and she's like, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, watching the game, what are you doing? And she's like, well, you need to get to Houston. And I was kind of like, why, what, what's going on? And she's like, we have your kidney. You have to be in Houston tonight. And so um, it was a little odd this time around because during COVID, nobody can go up into the surgery or up into the hospital with you, which was a little odd because my family had always been with me throughout any of the events, any time that I've had to be in the hospital, any surgery I've had, they've always been there. So we, um, we get there and um, like my family literally drops me off at the, at the hospital door and waves and says, good luck, call us, let us know how things are going. We'll be praying for you. So uh, 24 hours later, they prepped me. We had to wait for my um, kidney to fly in from California. And um, as soon as they hooked it up, my little bean has been working fabulously. Um, 
greater than any of us could have expected. So I am truly, truly grateful. Um, as far as my donor goes, all I know is that it's a lady from California. I've not been given um, any more information than that, although I hope to hope to find out more. Um, so yeah, that was really exciting. It's been super exciting to, um, and this is really silly, but even just to go to the bathroom to pee again is so exciting. Um, and also now I'm, I'm home now. So the other last week actually was my first week home. Um, I typically would go to dialysis on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So I, on Tuesday, I literally started to pick up my stuff to go again. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. I don't have to go. I don't have to give up 20 hours of my week anymore. I can do things now. I can travel. I can go and see people. Um, I can, if I, on Friday afternoon, decide I want to go to San Antonio, I can do that now. And it is so exciting. Um, the gift that my donor gave is just there's just no words. Excuse me. I don't think when you become a donor that you realize that you not only affect the recipient's life, but you affect their family, their friends, and their community. Because it's kind of like that story where they say if you toss a pebble into a lake and you see the ripples, that's what happens. Um, you know, now my family is not as concerned they don't have to make arrangements on if I get sick or if I get um, have problems at dialysis, who's gonna come back into town and help pick me up. Um, my friends, although they've been great and supportive, kind of also don't have to worry about like, okay, how do we include AJ in this? How do we make time for this? Um, how do we do these different things? And as far as my community, um, spreading the word. I'm just going to continue to spread the word and be an advocate for TOSA um, because I had gone into that with the idea that if I don't get a gift, somebody is going to get a gift. So I thank my donor immensely. The other thing too is that dialysis patients typically on average survive 10 years. So when I got sick, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to see 50. It's going to be really, really difficult. But I'm glad to say we've got plans for my 50th birthday coming up. And I feel like I've made it. And it's all thanks to this person. I don't know, but I love immensely. I'm sorry. Um, so all I can say is you never know whose life you're going to touch or how you can do it. And it's I know all of our stats say that organ donations save eight lives. Sometimes I think it saves more than that because like I said, it's not just the recipient, it's their family and their friends. Um, excuse me. And so just being a donor um, is just, I can't say it enough. I can't thank this lady enough. And just, I hope to find out who the family is. Um, so that I can express my great, great appreciation to them and prove to them that this is not a wasted gift. This was not the wrong decision. And then I hope to make a difference in my community because of them. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, I apologize. It's just been so great to be able to also be able to adjust my goals and my outlook on life. Um, I do have things I still need to worry about medically. Um, you know, I still have to take my anti-rejection medication. I still have to be very uh, concerned about, you know, people who are around me who may be sick with a common cold or not. And of course, right now with Corona, um, but gosh, I would not give it up for the world. This has been fantastic. So, um, Again, if you have questions on if it's the right thing to do, all I can say is as a recipient, you've changed my life. Donors change the life. So I just wanna thank Tosa for the opportunity to be a volunteer and to help get the word out. And I hope to continue to be able to do that. 
Thank you, AJ. That was amazing. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of great comments and feedback on your story and on Jordan's story. We thank um, both of these great, wonderful volunteers for sharing their testimonies. Um, and we also want to show our, our appreciation for everybody who is on this webinar for attending. And you know, the first 100 people uh, who complete a survey at the end of this webinar, you're gonna receive a Donate Life prize, which is this special uh, edition medal for Fiesta. We will be sending out an email asking you to complete the survey. So please be on the lookout for that and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you, uh, volunteers, again, for sharing your amazing stories and uh, to our panelists for answering the questions earlier. Again, if you haven't gotten your question in, there's still an opportunity to post your questions to our Q&A or uh, even our chat, and we will be addressing those shortly. Uh, it, also, if you would like uh, to use your smartphone, you too have the power to donate life and you can sign up and save lives. Uh, you can go online at donatelifetexas.org or if you have your smartphone, simply scan the QR code on your screen and it will take you to the registration so you can sign up and save lives. Again, one donor can save up to 75 lives as an organite and tissue donor. So again, at this time, we'll go ahead and take your questions. Uh, if, again, if you will put your question in the Q&A or the chat box, and please remember we have our special panelists here to answer and address those questions. So I'm going to go with Amanda first. Amanda, can you let me know if we have any questions in the Q&A box? Yes, so one was just a comment. It says, no questions, just a comment on excellent sharing by the panel, some good information that they did not know, and they appreciate the information by people and how to go through the process. And then also we have someone asking, can autoimmune Crohn's disease patients, can they be organ donors? Ishmael, would you mind answering that question, please? Sure, for the Crohn's disease, you can definitely still be an organ donor. Uh, for the shingles, if it's active shingles, we would have to do a little bit more evaluation um, and they can do a little bit more testing to find out. I would say it's not gonna be an automatic uh, rule out for organ donation, but it's something we would highly look at and get a couple more additional medical directors involved to uh, evaluate before we move forward. Thank you. Any other questions, Amanda? Yes, so the next question is, will donation cost my family anything? Does any of our panelists wanna take that? With organ donation and tissue and eye donation, all of the co costs are covered by the um, OPOs, the tissue banks and eye banks uh, for donation. So it would be no cost to the family. Great. And the next question we have is, someone is asking, can you please comment on the fact about the general price list at some funeral homes, including a charge for post-donation restoration? I'll comment on it. The costs associated, as Ismail said, for donation are never passed along to a family. We are not, however, uh, authorized <laughs> to tell funeral homes what their price lists should reflect or should say in, that, in regards to what it is that they charge. And, and unfortunately, they sometimes make people believe, lead, lead families to believe that those costs are being charged because of something that organizations who handle donation have done that make it necessary to upsell them on the cost of preparation of that body for uh, burial. What we ask, and I can only speak from my organization, United Tissue Resources uh, perspective, and, the re and because it comes up uh, not often, but sometimes with regard to tissue donation, is to contact us with whatever that funeral home has said is being assessed to them because of what we have supposedly done to that uh, loved one, to their loved one, and let us then assume those costs. Uh, it's not something that comes up with every case, but we definitely want the community to know that there is no extra cost associated with donation, especially tissue donation, because that is our purview, uh, because of the choice that they've made as families. And if that is something that does come up, contact us about that. Thank you, Lynn. And Amanda? Yes, the next question is for Clarissa, if you want to pass along, do prior LASIK procedures affect eye donation? And Daniel, would you mind uh, responding to that question? Absolutely. Uh, prior LASIK does not rule you out as a donor. You can still donate. 
with advancements in processing of the corneal tissue, we are actually able to transplant different layers of the cornea. So the, the whole cornea may not be transplanted because you may have some scarring from the LASIK. However, the uh, endothelial side of the tissue is absolutely transplantable and in need, definitely. So it, it is not a rule out, you can still donate. Thank you, Daniel. Any additional questions, Amanda? Yes, Clarissa. The next one is, I am 75 years old with health issues. Can I still donate? Ismail, will you want to answer that? For organ donation, we evaluate. We do have a cutoff age frame, which is 75, so you would still classify in there. And it would vary based on the health issues you currently have. I'd say that we, we, you know, we'd still always take the opportunity to evaluate the potential of someone of that age frame mm -hmm. with their health issues, but it's it's hard to say without knowing uh, some specifics. Mm -hmm. For right. allopred, I'm sorry, for tissue donation, and as an advocate for donate life, what I've always said is, if you think that you are too mm -hmm. old or too sick, stop thinking at all and register just register because medical professionals from all of the organizations that handle organ, eye, and tissue donation will make the determination as to whether or not you are truly eligible for donation. I will say this, of course, there are criteria, as Ismail said, said for organ donation and so forth. And even in some cases for tissue and eye on an individual basis, the decisions will be made. But keep this in mind, the oldest organ donor in the United States was 92 years old. And that's just, it wasn't done from the Texas Organ Sharing Alliance, but it's out there as general information. The oldest corneal donor was 107 years old. I'm not saying that every 107 year old or 92 year old will be eligible, but that lends credence to what I was saying about, don't think you are too old or too sick, just register and let medical professionals make the final determination. Thank you, great response. Amanda, any further questions? Yes, the next question we have is, what about bone donation? That is allograft tissue, once again, uh, that uh, is definitely something that is surgically recoverable from uh, eligible donors, and it can be used for such a variety of things, and for so long after the day of uh, surgical recovery that it is almost miraculous. Bone is so flexible in its usages that, as I mentioned earlier, it can be used for everything from dental procedures to restoration of bone that is lost due to, to trauma or disease. There are images and stories out there of children who were born with conditions that caused weakened or brittle bones, or maybe they developed cancers that created that same condition. And the donation made possible by donor heroes got those children back into living life as children would, uh, being able to do the things that children do. So definitely bone is something that is surgically recoverable and in some cases can be stored for years after the date of surgical recovery. Thank you. Amanda, any additional questions? That covers it for the Q&A portion. Wonderful. Uh, would the panelists like to add any additional comments to any of the questions? Okay, great. And Edwina, do we have anything from social media? Yeah, we've got no, the questions that we do have were asked here in the comments as well. Wonderful. And of course, everyone, if you think of something after this webinar, please reach out to us and we will address the appropriate donation expert on the panel and get that answer for you. And for everyone that has missed some parts of this webinar, or if you would like to watch again, we are recording this and we will be posting to our social media. So please tune in for that at Texas. TX Sharing Organization, Organ Sharing. And so, of course, we want to remind you all, you can sign up to save lives and please visit DonateLifeTexas.org. We thank all of you for attending and we thank our panel of experts for also sharing such valuable information. And we hope you have a happy National Donate Life Month.